Thank you, Karel. So I just spent a week in Greece. I sort of function as the point man for the Schiller Institute in our work with Greece. And last week was my fourth trip to Greece in the last five years. And up until now, visiting Greece has been like visiting a concentration camp. People are suffering terribly at that time. At these times when I went in the past, they were, they, they were in despair. They, uh, they had a government, a quizzling government, and they felt the situation was hopeless. Now, the situation is like Stalingrad. The suffering continues. But now they have a government, a government that was elected by the population as a signal to the Europeans that they have had enough. And they voted in the most radical government that has sat in a European capital, I don't know, in maybe 100 years. And the suffering continues, but the fight is there. And this is very, very important. And it's very important for people in this room to understand what that means from the standpoint of what their personal responsibility should be in this next period. But just to give you some graphic idea of what the situation is like, it never ceases to amaze me. I've been there four times in the last five years, and the situation gets unbearably worse. The, the policy of the government, the policy, the, not the policy of this government, but this new government has inherited a policy of genocide imposed by the so-called financial insti EU institutions. It is everywhere to be seen. You know, you read in the newspapers here, it's 27% unemployment. This is not 27% unemployment, it's 45% unemployment. They don't tell you about the 300,000 small businesses that, that have gone bankrupt in, in, uh, in, in Greece that don't show up on the official unemployment rolls. They don't, you have to go to Athens and see all the boarded up shops. These are the small businesses. These are the, that supported families. Uh, so we're talking about 45%. Now where, where did, how do these people live? They're living on the, many of these people are living on the pensions of their grandparents. So you have as many as 10 people. You know, the grandparents, their sons, their sons' families, living on a pension of 400 euros a month, a pension that has been cut by between 25 and 40%. And these are the pensions that, the, that Brussels wants them not to pay this month so they can pay the debt. So this is the situation. Uh, the, the, the lack of uncertainty that has been created in the country is, is, is unbearable. I've, I talk to people, uh, normal people, taxi drivers, to businessmen. And you know, the uncertainty is at all levels. You know, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the, the pensioner who, who not only worries about whether he's gonna get his pension, but whether he can pay for the medications that keep him alive. The, the, uh, the, this cutting off of liquidity by the e European Central Bank, I mean, the European Draghi is, is flooding the bankrupt banks in France and Germany with trillions of, of euros worth of liquidity for nothing. It's free. Greece gets nothing. I mean, you have to understand what it means not to have liquidity in the banking system. Gov companies that are, that are viable, that have customers, that, that uh, we're talking even uh, the hotels for tourism, they can't get simple liquidity they need to operate their companies from a day-to-day -day basis. 
No company. They say, oh, the EU says, oh, you have to, you know, cut your wages down to the level of uh, 300 euros a month uh, in order to attract foreign investment. Well, foreign investment's not attracted to Greece. That's not the way you attract foreign investment. And they, who's going to go to Greece now and invest with all this uncertainty and the fact that the country economy has collapsed? So, you know, for instance, we were in, when we were in Athens, we were in the in the business district. I mean, this is not some neighborhood that is known to be, you know, crime ridden, but this is the, the main business district of Athens, of the country. And it's, and it's like Needle Park. We're walking the streets and we saw uh, drug addicts shooting up. We, uh, we had to wait for a bus to get someplace. We're in, the, in front of the National Muse Archaeological Museum. I mean, this is one of the most beautiful neoclassical buildings uh, in Europe. And, and we're waiting for a bus there. And I'm looking around, and I'm, and I'm dressed like this. And I realize I was the only one dressed like this. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the national dress is blue jeans. Now, this isn't, these aren't designer blue jeans. They're wearing blue jeans because they're unemployed. Blue jeans are cheap. <laughs> they can't afford good clothes. And it's just not the people in the streets, the people in the ministries. At first I thought, well, this is the style, you know, that Syriza, their leftist government, and blah, blah, blah. But no, the country has become impoverished. So now, but, but now there's resistance. This government, the Syriza party, up until the previous election, never got more than 4% of the vote. Uh, and now, the entire nation, of all walks of life, people from the conservative party, who, who were originally from the conservative parties, as well as the left, voted for this go government to give the high sign to, the, uh, to Brussels, and, uh, and Berlin and Paris and the other countries that they have had enough. Now, if you look at Syriza, this is not your normal leftist party of, uh, you know, your cocktail socialists. Uh, Greece has a sort of a unique post-war history and uh, some people try to call Syriza Euro-communists because many of them are communists who left the, the uh, 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 traditional communist party which still exists. And they left that party because the traditional communist party wasn't doing anything for the country. And uh, more than that, you know, some of these leaders who are our age, uh, as students, were imprisoned. In 1974, you had a, up until 19, between 67 and 64, you had a, a military junta. And uh, many of these leaders, these ministers, were actually jailed because they were student activists and, and tortured. So, you know, this is, this is something unique. And, and Greece has a, a history of resistance a history of, of 3,000 years of resistance. You have, you have the Persian Wars, you have the, the wars against the Ottoman Empire for, for independence. You have the war, the ongoing war, which has not ended against the British Empire. And you know, a, a lot of Greek classicists, not you know, European uh, professors of Greek classics try to say that, that, well, you know, the population that is in Greece now has nothing to do with the ancients, right? Even the language is not the same, really, and blah, blah, blah. If you tell that to a Greek, he'll kill you. Uh, because this is what gives them the strength. And the question of resistance is very, very deep. In 1942, a 16-year-old youth climbed the Acropolis in Nazi-occupied Athens and pulled down the Greek, not the Greek, but the, the Nazi flag. 
And in that act, he started the European resistance against the Nazi occupation of Europe. That man is, ne is now 95 years old, and he sits in the European Parliament as a member of Syriza. And that's what the nature of the resistance is. It's everyone, young people, middle-aged people, and especially retired people who have been in government, or have been in politics, who, who, although have not been very active prior to this crisis, you know, are fighting the struggle of their lives. And this is the, and I've talked to these people, they're 70 years old, some of them. They are, <laughs> Mr. Chris Anthopoulos, who's, who is a member of the APOM party. He is a retired diplomat. He had to sell his car, he had to move out of his apartment, he had to uh, move into the, into the traditional country home, and he is fighting, and there are others. So the resistance is there. Now there's another resistance fighter, his name is Mikis Theodorakis, and this is very important because this tradition is what motivates people now in this fight. Now, Mikis Theodorakis, if you don't know the name, he's the most famous Greek modern composer. He's a man who is, I think he will be celebrating his 90th birthday. He's very sick because the, the wounds that he suffered during these various tortures during this war, when he was in the wartime resistance, during the Civil War in the 40s, and during the military junta in the 60s and 70s, are, have, uh, have, uh, are finally affecting his, his health very severely, and he can't be as active. But this man is a living legend, and is a symbol of the struggle. And what, what, had, what did he do? He created the new music in the 50s and 60s, taking the poetry of modern poets, of Greece's modern poets, many of them were Nobel Prize winners, who lived through these civil wars and these struggles against the reactionary forces and, and Nazi occupation, who wrote very, very moving poems. And he put them to music. And he used these, this music to mobilize the population politically in the 50s and 60s. And many of the young people who were part of this movement are now in this government. So the resistance is there. You know, it's everywhere though. You know, when I first got there, uh, 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 this trip, I had a, we took a taxi. I always talk to the taxi drivers. I was a taxi driver. I have some solid feelings of solidarity with them. And they, they know the situation on the ground. And I just asked them, well, what do you think of the new government? And he said, well, the government is trying. And then he goes, you know, we're not part, we don't feel that we're part of Europe. We feel that Europe, we own Europe. We created Europe. And that's, that's the attitude they have. I spoke to a, a, one of my friends as an engineer. And you know, in Greece now, everyone is taxed. Everything is taxed. The unborn are taxed. The, uh, the, uh, uh, the unemployed are taxed. And, uh, and if you have children, you're taxed higher. So he told me, you know, we don't, us engineers, many of them, pay taxes despite the fact that they don't work because they're supposedly independent con consultants, and many of them have, have uh, tax debts. Uh, he told me, well, you know, us engineers, we meet at the Engineers Association, and we don't sit there and complain. We discuss this crisis from the standpoint of discussing Socrates, Plato, uh, and the Greek classics to learn, to, to apply those concepts to understanding this crisis and fighting through this crisis. But let me just ask, let me just say, the point is that when I went to Greece, like I always go to Greece, I asked myself, what am I going to tell these people? 
Am I going to tell them that, well, you know, it's the financial oligarchy. I think they know this. And I, am I going to tell them, well, uh, you should have Glass-Steagall. Glass-Steagall is in their program. Uh, most people want to, want to hang the bankers. Am I going to tell them, uh, join the BRICS? Well, they, in effect, join the BRICS. They're more for the BRICS than the BRICS are for them in a certain sense. They know this. They're acting on it. Uh, I'm not going to tell them, well, you should simply leave the Eurozone. Why should Greece, the weakest of all the countries, take on the most difficult task of all? Greece is not Germany, it's not France. It doesn't have the, the resources to take on this responsibility now. They have imports. You can say, well, they can have a national bank and blah, 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 but they have imports. Who's going to pay for the medicines they have to import? Uh, so in any case, so I, I as, a, as a, a political organizer, as a political representative of, of a movement in Europe and the United States, I approach them, I say, okay, I have to tell them, what, it, what am I doing in this? What are we doing in this war? Because it's a war. They're at, a, they're at the point, as they say in the military, on the front line. They have their mission. They got their mission from a commander that's higher than all of us, and they're carrying it out. And they have the responsibility, and they've taken the responsibility. So as usual in these circumstances, I brought the ideas and the analysis of Mr. Lyndon LaRouche, the founder of this organization. And Mr. LaRouche has a very significant understanding of our situation now, particularly in the United States. So in the United States, Mr. LaRouche has consistently said we have to pass Glass-Steagall. We were the ones who started that movement. Uh, we have to, we have to uh, join the BRICS. And we've been mobilizing for this. Now, we have a big break. Uh, there's a, the former governor of, of Maryland, Martin O'Malley, has declared for presidency. And Mr. Lewis has said he's the only competent candidate at this moment uh, because he has made Glass-Steagall and Wall Street the main plank of his political campaign. And I told people this, and I said, well, we as a, as a Schiller Institute are not forming a, well, vote for Martin O'Malley campaign, but we are trying to create the policy establishment needed now, the presidential establishment needed now to deal with the problems we are facing now in the next period and that's the way we're going to get O'Malley or someone else with these qualifications into the White House. And I told them that Greece, the Greek situation and Greece itself must act in the way to impact this development and get this change. And once we get a change like this in, in, in the United States, we have the power to change the policy in Europe. And I tell you, the higher the, the, the people that you spoke to closer, to, closer to the center of government, understood that immediately. There was no question in their mind. And they said, this is, you're exact, this is exactly right. And this is the way we have to act. So the point is, the point is, what is our, what is the people sitting in this room, what have they done in this war to, 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 to destroy the evil oligarchy that's responsible for what is happening in Greece and will happen in the rest of Europe if we don't, if we don't stop it. And that's the way people, I think, have to think and that's the way people have to act. You know, in Greece, there's a famous beloved author named Nikos Kazantzakis. He wrote in the first half of the, of the last century and on his tomb, he has a inscription, I fear nothing, I hope for nothing, therefore I am free. The point is, I act because I have to act. I fear nothing because I have to act. I act not with a, with a hope that 
necessarily that there will be a change, but I have to act because of my humanity. And that's the attitude that many Greeks have now, and that's the attitude that we have to have when we leave this room and act, as I say, to destroy this financial oligarchy, build, what do we have? Our weapon is, is the Glass-Steagall. That will destroy the financial system. Our allies are the bricks. And our power are the ideas that we can generate to save humanity, not at the, just at this moment, but 50, 100, 200 years from now. And that's what the Greek situation really is all about. Thank you.